Welcome. Thanks. Uh, do you get to the, do you do a lot of cons? Uh, no, this is my second one. I think. Wow, really? Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. And this one's obviously better than the other one that you went. Way to. better. Yeah, you're goddamn right. It is. <laughs> the, the patrons are way better than. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is all good. So, uh, what for not doing cons for such a long time? What was it that that inspired you to to, to finally meet us idiots? Well. You know, honestly, it's uh, uh, nice to uh, to meet people that appreciate my movies. I really, uh, I, 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 it's, uh, honestly, it's an honor. Yeah. You know, you do movies and they go up on the big screen and they get rented, but you know, not often you get to really meet the people that like your work. What's uh, so far? I mean, you've only been to a couple of them, but what are some of your favorite? Interaction with fans so far and, and people who come to the cons. Uh, anything surprising? Uh, sometimes how detailed the questions can be. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of time on our hands. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. And, uh, but uh, I can't answer some of the questions like what happened to Paul? <laughs> I have no idea. Same as any of you. Yeah. That's always so funny because you know, uh, so many of us obsess with movies and watch them over and over and over again to the point where we know them by heart, we think we know the characters, and then we just assume that, you know, it wasn't just a job for you and all you do. It, was, it actually wasn't really a dumb job. You know, it's a passion. Yeah. And uh, um, you, you, when you're making a movie, you, you kind of live it, and, and there's nothing else. Yeah. You know, it's just all you think about, you go to sleep thinking about it, you dream about it, you wake up thinking about it. Yeah. So, well, okay, uh, how, how'd you get into filmmaking? Uh, I uh, just decided that that's what I wanted to do. I was an artist, and I was in art school, and uh, I had always liked movies. And my mom was a film librarian in Westport, Connecticut. Is that right? Yeah. And she was also a Hitchcock fan. And she would take me to uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies when they opened. She took me out of school to go see uh, North by Northwest. I you said, good mother. <laughs> Not really, but I will. Uh, but she took me out of school. She North by Northwest, which I saw in the front row of the balcony of a Radio City Music Hall. Oh, and that blew me away, especially the airplane scene. And then she took me to Psycho. I think I must have been about eight. I'm not sure. I was really young. And uh, after Janet Lee got killed. I said, Mom, I, I, I just can't sit here. I just, I'm too scared. She said, okay, go wait outside. <laughs> I'll see you when it's over. And that's what I did. I got stood on the sidewalk at night outside and waited for her to come out. Wow. Little did you know that years later you would direct murder scenes that were even more worse, that were worse than what you saw. And, and, and directed Janet Lee. And directed Janet Lee in H2O. Yeah. How yeah. about yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, you know, well, you mentioned H2O. Um, I love that movie. Thanks. I love it. Uh, all the new ones pale in comparison to that one. Uh, I'm not. I'm, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to lose a lot of a lot of people. I do not like the new, the trilogy. At I, all. I, I, I don't have a comment. No. Okay. I, yeah. So I'm not a fan at all. In fact, I actively dislike them. But um, I personally thought that you know now this next one is called Halloween. It ends. Uh, I personally think it should have ended in 1978. But, I love what you did in 1998, and I went in with the lowest expectations. I thought, you know, and everybody talks about how Jamie Lee Curtis, you would get to work with her a couple of times, because she did Forever Young. Forever Young, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis and Mel Gibson. Um, but I thought that her performance in H2O was better than anything she's done in these new ones. It, it was, yeah, it was about, like, I mean, it, 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 it was about this woman's traumatic experience, how she was dealing with it as an alcoholic, and I thought, that arc that she had, that Lori had in H2O, was so much more compelling than anything that they're doing now. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of my favorite, like seriously, I think what you what you guys did with Lori Strode's character is so much better than what's, what's happening now. Well, we, we did, you know, any movie is, is almost, pretty much only as good as the screenplay that you start with. And uh, we were fortunate to have some good writers on that. Um, Kevin Williamson, uncredited, um, did a lot of work on that. Yeah. And Kevin and I and Jamie basically came up with the concept. And, and uh, Jamie was very, uh, uh, you know, she, it was her idea. 
to do H2O. She said, it's 20 years later, let's do, uh, I want to do a Halloween movie. Yeah. And uh, I happened to be doing a pilot to Dawson's Creek in North Carolina at the time. South Carolina? Yeah. Thanks. The Dawson's and, Creek fans here. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Kevin Williamson, who created it, was there. We were shooting the pilot, and Jamie was doing a movie on the lot. And uh, Kevin wanted to meet her, and I took him over to her, tra to her trailer, and we started talking. And that's kind of the genesis for how H2O came about. And uh, originally, John, she wanted Carpenter to direct it, which would have been great, but he, he decided he didn't want to do it for whatever reason. And, uh, were you hesitant at all because you had done Friday the 13th, or were you like, I don't care what franchise it is, I'll do it? Not at all. I was confident I could do a good job. Yeah. Well, you did a great job. I, I have to say, there, I, 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 I really, I love H2O. I think it's great. And there is a moment in that movie, and as a person who, I had PJ Souls up here uh, just a little while ago and told her, as I've told the people before, that the original Halloween like, changed my life. It was when I saw it, I realized what a director did. It was yeah. sounded incredible. And, it, and when I saw H2O, the moment where Lori and Michael, they're face to face in that circular window, every single time I watch that goddamn movie, I get the chills at that moment. I'm not kidding. It's like that character and that character they meet. And all of these other, you know, like that moment to me is iconic. Now, when you guys were making it, did you know, like, this is, yeah. this is the shit right now. We are going to have these two characters meet up face to face. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit about how that happened. Well, uh, first of all, that it was set up by that, I think, a terrific sequence before where they drop the keys and they're locked out and, and there's Michael. And it just was, and I'd always had a vision for what that final confrontation would be and how it would be the culmination of the, the suspense that we were setting up yeah. uh, prior to that, in that scene with the drop keys. And uh, I had a vision for what um, that would look like. Uh, and uh, pr my longtime production designer uh, had built the gates, you know, with the iron thing, and, uh, and uh, he uh, built a door that they were gonna meet. And when I saw the door, when it was built, somehow I had in mind, I hadn't mentioned it to him, he had a square window. And it was kind of a large square window. I said, no, you, we have to have a window that he can't get through, but one that frames their faces perfectly. And I thought that that round, having the window be round, would frame their confrontation in a way that no, it wouldn't work any other way, as well, any other way. It's perfect, man. I mean, seriously. So that, and I think that's that's part of the, if you look at H2O and some of my other movies, that the production design is an important yeah. aspect, like uh, I don't know, Lake Placid or any of them, really. Yeah. Or any of the TV work, too, like The Wonder Years, I did the pilot, and that was, had a certain look to it. Yeah. The, you know, the look of the films that you do are, is great. And, 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 HBO, or HBO, H2O. The uh, the buildup of the suspense in that sequence is unbelievable, man. Like really beautiful. Well, I think I think that if what is missing in the later films, I haven't seen them. I saw maybe one of them or half of one. Is <clears throat> to me, it's not about kills. It's not about blood. It's not about seeing body parts chopped off. It's about the suspense, and it's about filmmaker, me, or any filmmaker, setting up for the audience to imagine what can happen. I can't make it as scary as you can, as you can imagine it's going to happen, because it's all personal. It's, so I look at it as my job to uh, create the tension and create the, uh, the scenario that, that the audience takes over in their mind. And, you know, it, uh, and, 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 and also important as far as suspense goes to, to get some misdirection. So you're going in one direction and then you, and you're leaving the audience on, and I don't mean in a, in a I mean in a good way, I don't mean in a bad way. Uh, and then make, turn it around on them. I think an example of that would be in H2O where the kid drops the uh, wine opener down in the garbage disposal. And everybody knows 
Michael Myers would have turned that garbage disposal on and cut off his arm. Yeah. But you don't do that. Yeah. You go the other way and, yeah. and you give it something else. You also do that in the in the uh, the Hello Cool G uh, scenes where the where the car is like the whole bit about getting the car into yeah. the into the thing is so beautifully done. And you, misdirection, man, you do that in, in that scene too. Well, it's and it's, it's it's fun for the audience. I mean, it, it makes it entertaining. You uh, you never know quite what's going to happen next. And uh, uh, I think I think a lot of that is because of my mom taking me to Hitchcock. Please. There you go. Yeah. So uh, the association that you have uh, with uh, Sean Cunningham is that? I mean, uh, well, we we started Sean Cunningham, Wes Craven, and myself started together. The first movie I ever worked on was the first Last House on the Left. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had, you know, I was, a, like I said, an art student, and then I became a ski bum. I went to Steamboat Springs, Colorado, and uh, I was a ski bum there for a uh, short season. And I'm looking around, and <clears throat> I was 21 or something, and there's people 30 years old doing the same stupid shit I was doing as a ski bum. I said, I gotta do something else. So I made a decision to, you know, I'm gonna be a director. And uh, so I did what anybody would do. I moved back to Westport, Connecticut to become a director. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I did that because uh, it was a very artistic town at that time. And there were local filmmakers who did industrial films and sports films and stuff like that. And I started working in PA and doing stuff, whatever I could. And I heard there was a movie being shot in town, and they were, and I tracked him down, and I had known Sean's family. I didn't know Sean, but I knew his brothers. And uh, it was Wes Craven, uh, Last House on the Left. And I said, you know, you gotta hire me. <laughs> and so they hired me, Sean hired me for, I think I got paid $15 a week to do whatever they told me to do. <laughs> And that, I, I, it was great. It was a great experience, and I, and I became close with Wes. I became the assistant editor on that film. And then Wes and Sean and I shared an office in New York City for many years. And and we both we all got started that way. And it's just kind of weird. I'm sitting out there at my table, and I see, you know, Jason's going by, and Freddie's going by, and then we created all this stuff. And that, that we would be here today yeah. and, and, and see the impact, it's unbelievable. It is, right? And then, and then to have a movie where Jason fights Freddy. <laughs> what the hell is going on here? Uh, anyway, it was remarkable. So yeah, we, we, we had a long association, Wes and I were very close, and uh, it's kind of weird that the three of us sort of, I don't know, made our way somehow. Well, the, uh, another film that you did associated with, with Sean Cunningham was House. House. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, so I don't know if it's funny, I hope it won't take too long or bore you too much, but, uh, so, Fred Decker, who you may know from Night of the Creeps, I, 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 I met him and the Pado guys, you may know about the Pado guys, a group of young guys, hustling filmmakers. Anyway, so I hired Fred to write a Godzilla movie for me when I had the rights to Godzilla. Which you had the rights to Godzilla? Yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah, I did, and I, I messed up by not <laughs> taking it. Well, I learned a big lesson. I, I, after Friday the 13th Part 3 and 3D, I was trying to figure out what do I want to do next? And I'm in a friend's swimming pool, floating around, thinking what the hell? And I'd always loved Godzilla as a kid. Every time I was on the TV, you know, yeah. when, when I was a kid, we would watch it. Yeah. And uh, I said, I'm going to make Godzilla in 3D. So I called my lawyers, Michael Lynn in New York City, and I said, I, I, I want to make, I'm, come with me to uh, Japan. We're going to get the rights to Godzilla. And I had just had a brief communication with Toho. And we get on the plane together. He comes from New York to LA. We get on the plane. We're going to, to to Tokyo. And he goes, "All right, so you you have the rights, right?" I said, "No, we're going to get them." He said, "You're taking me here. We don't know." Anyway, we ended up after five days of negotiation getting the rights for Godzilla. 
I came back to LA, and they gave me money to create this, get a script written. And I found Fred Decker, he wrote a really good script. I got William Stout, I don't know if you need to know him, he's a great artist, a, a terrific artist. And uh, Dave Stevens, too, did some storyboards for me. So I put together a whole package, and Stan Winston did a model of Godzilla for me. And, uh, and I took it around to the studios of Warner Brothers, who said, we want to make this movie. And I said, okay, great. And uh, Peter, who uh, 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 the producers, and big time producers of Warner Brothers, uh, were gonna produce it. And uh, so, get down to the nitty gritty of Warner Brothers, we sit down with Terry Simmel, the boss of Warner Brothers at the time, he says, all right, we wanna make this movie, but we're gonna only give you $8 million, which is actually a fair amount of money back in those days. And being the idiot it is I am, I said, no, I, I can't do it for that much money. And Peter Guber, who was one of the producer, said, uh, said to me later, he said, look, Steve, there's a window of opportunity to get a movie made. And when, you've, when that window opens, you take it. And I regret to this day that I didn't just say, okay, because by the time I got them pregnant, they would have still been in whatever it was. Anyway, that was one of my big regrets, is not getting that Godzilla movie made. Yeah. And then Warner Brothers, sort of behind my back, when we got the rights and made all those movies. You know, like anyway, that's, that's life. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, House. Yeah, oh, House. Yes. So anyway, House. Uh, <clears throat> I had done the first Friday, Friday part two, I guess it was. I can't remember. But anyway, I just kind of started in Hollywood. And, oh no, I did the Godzilla thing, and, and Fred Decker knew this kid who had, he and he had come up with an idea, Ethan Wiley, for the movie House, and Ethan had written a script, and it was bizarre, I don't even know the movie, it's kind of a weird, funny, scary, mix-up kind of movie. And, uh, uh, but I, I saw it from the beginning, I, I, I just saw what this movie could be. And uh, somehow, and, and, and I thought, well, let's see, Sean and I have done Friday the 13th together. I'll get Sean to produce it. Who's going to say no to financing this movie? It'd be, you know, not going to cost much money. And uh, so uh, we uh, took it around, and I forget which studio. I think it was I, one of the studios said, okay, we're going to make it. This was on a Friday. So that weekend, I bought a new car. Oh man. Oh. Talk about never learning any lessons. <laughs> On Monday, the head of that studio, Jeff Sagansky, his name was at the time, calls me up and he says, Steve, we can't make the movie. But I said, Jeff, how am I gonna I didn't say this, but I thought, how the hell am I gonna pay for this new car? But anyway, somehow Sean was able to raise some money privately or independently, I can't remember how we got it. And uh, so anyway, so we get we I'm making the movie. And uh, we ended up with a great cast, and make the movie. And then when you, after you finish a movie, you hire a company to do the sound effects and do all the sound stuff. Not the music, but the sound. Uh, especially the effects, sound effects, and the mixing it together. And there was a guy that was the head of that company who was in charge of it all. And he signed different things, and he was very involved in the, in the completion of the movie including going to the mix and finishing the whole movie. So we go to the first screen, the test screen, which we did in the valley, and the movie's going great. I mean, it's like people are laughing at the right time, scared at the right time, and I see the guy, Tom, pacing back and forth behind the seats. And I go back to him, I go, Tom, what's wrong? He goes, can you believe they're laughing at the movie? said, yeah, it's a comedy. <laughs> He'd been working on it for three months and didn't understand what the movie was. So, I don't know. Yeah. But fortunately, the audience did. Yeah, that's a terrific movie. I will say this as an aside, the sequel has one of my favorite titles in movie. Oh, the best. Second story. House 2, the second story. Yeah. <laughs> the best title. <laughs> sequel title. No time. question about it. Yeah, yeah that's so great. great. Um, can we get a quick, do you have a Betty White story? Because I, 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 her performance in Lake Classic is awesome. She is uh, yeah. so great. She, uh, 
Well, David E. Kelly wrote the part for her. I mean, he had her in mind the whole time. And we were very lucky that she agreed to do it. So we, I, we shot it in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, first day in the, maybe it was in pre-production, I can't remember, just in the beginning when Betty and I started working together, uh, she said to me, she goes, because, uh, you know, act, actors approach it by their character. They, they think, who is this character? Where were they from? How'd they grow up? What were they? And she saw this character as a rural farmer type gal, and, you know, very, very middle American type of person. She said, so Steve, the one thing I don't understand is where did she learn all these words? <laughs> and, I, and, you know, sometimes you just have to profess ignorance. I said, Betty, I have no idea. The only thing I know is it's going to be hilarious. And it was, and she made it even better than on the page. She was great. But you know, I mean, the thing about it, everybody, you know, she was just a, incredible, oh, but she was a really bawdy chick. She was. And, and I don't know if people really realize that, but she really was. She had, she was very much like Sue that she played on, the, on the, the Mary Tyler Moore show, yeah. which is called something else. But anyway, um, but she was a wonderful person, and I got to know her pretty well, and we would spend some time together. Um, we would walk in Stanley Park in Vancouver, take walks every weekend. Yeah. And she, but she was a very committed animal activist and a, yeah. just a great person. I love her. That's, it's so great that you got to work with her. Yeah. And, and seriously, uh, Steve, it is, I think, it might be my favorite Betty Wood performance of all time. Well, so like, she was good. She, we had a really, you know, David E. Kelly, a terrific writer. He, he uh, wrote a great script for that. Yeah. Um, it, it, of the horror films that you've made, because you did Warlock as well, uh, of, do you, yeah, yeah, which one do you get the most questions about? Which one are the fan favorites? What stuff do you sign the most of? You know, it, it's really all over the place. Some of them came in today with a, with a poster from Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. I oh, yeah. Know, if you remember that one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, my son claims that if I had, I did these two movies for Disney, Wild Hearts Can't Be Blo Broken and uh, My Father the Hero. And he saw them for me, right? I did. And my son said, "You know, Dad, because they're kind of girl movies." I had Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken is my daughter's favorite movie, and uh, he said to me, "You know, Dad, if you hadn't made those two movies, I never would have gotten a girlfriend in high school." <laughs> <laughs> but but to ask me, you know, uh, it, it just it's all over the place, and it's. Uh, well, it's gratifying to know uh, how much uh, people have liked my different movies yeah. all over, through the years. I uh, I was very tempted to bring my uh, my DVD of uh, Felicity. A Felicity, you're yeah. a Felicity fan. Yeah. I'm a Felicity freak. Yeah. I love that show. Uh, I don't care if you horror fans mock me. I love Felicity. Well, that was a good show. J.J. Abrams uh, created that show. And J.J. and I had worked together for quite a bit. He, did, he wrote Forever Young. And... Uh, uh, JJ asked me if I'd do a, uh, an episode or two for, for yeah. them. And uh, the, the weird thing about that one is the episode that I directed was... Uh, and season, had three, a, season three episode. Was it season three? Episode one. <laughs> episode one, that's what it was. Yep. And uh, it was a new hairstyle for Felicity. Yep. And also, it was the first... Wait, the credits. I I have this the credit. Right. It was the new credit sequence. New credit sequence, and was that the the, the lesbian love story? Uh, yes. Okay. So it was going to be the first. It was the first girl girl kiss on network television. Yeah. So they go, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> so the producers uh, at the time and the network were like. Oh my God, what's going to happen? And I go, come on, what's this? This is, right. this is life. And so we just filmed it, and there was no reaction at all from anybody. I mean, I think that's fantastic that there was no no kickback, there was no nothing. It was just accepted, and uh, anyway, that was kind of gratifying. Yeah. Well, uh, it's great, and uh, uh, I, I love everything you do, man. I just think you're. Appreciate uh, you coming to Tanks. Being uh, this is only the second convention you've done. Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate it. So, uh, Steve, Steve Meyer, everybody.